You are listening to the Backstage Pass podcast, hosted by Hannah Trigwell and brought to you by Tommy. Joe Dolman, how are you? I'm very well, Hannah Trigwell. Good. I'm you? so glad. I'm good. I'm good. For those of the listeners or the watchers of this video, you are an independent musician, artist, songwriter, musical director. Kind of like Jack of all trades, master of none. Oh, um, come on. Oh, no. I actually, like, I feel like I sometimes spread myself incredibly thin. Yeah. Is the one that you prefer over the others? I definitely would say being the artist in the in the sense of like being the person who has to be the face of things is my least favorite. Right. Um, not not like I, oh my God, I hate being an artist. And it's <laughs> so annoying, like having to be on stage and like people looking at me and stuff. It's, it's not like that. It's just more like I love creating music and I love like, you know, writing songs and producing. And I love, um, especially when it comes to like, you know, like I said like being an MD and session player and stuff. I love being part of a bigger bigger picture and being part of something it's like a bigger a bigger thing you know so that's where I get my most satisfaction as opposed to like just being the face of it you know yeah what goes into musical direction um it depends on the project I guess um I wouldn't say I'm like massively experienced in it I mean I've been doing it for a couple of years for the diff a few different projects but I just think it's like um a in a vague layman's terms is like taking someone's music and trans translating it to a live show that is uh accurate to the artist's vision and um do you um, get a lot of notes for that from the artist i mean massively varies actually like some oh, right. some are some artists are like might as well i might as well not be doing that job like they might as well not pay me because they have such a clear vision of what they want <laughs> but sometimes they just don't want to be the person who has to like sit there and like make the click tracks up and like you know make sure that um you know everything is just mixed right it depends it depends on like the pr the size of the project massively because like some some bands might be just triggering stuff off like a sample pad like an spd like you know roll and make and they might just have the track as a stereo track or they might be running it out of ableton and they might have like a sound card that's got multiple outputs or you might have like bigger playback rigs that can do like 16 outputs so it means you can mix track to 16 outputs which is like having 16 extra instruments it's easier to mix it because there's more going on but by easier it almost also can make the the live show vary more because if you've got a different room different sound engineer every night i don't think you'd, you i think you'd have the same sound guy or like you know same same sound engineer on the on your gig if you were at that level because you'd have someone mixing it accurately yeah. every night but it's but tricky like, when you have different sound guys Oh, and by tricky, I mean awful. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. I I went straight to the worst. You were like, yeah, tricky, like tricky. being really like being no, like really conservative it's about genuinely it. Genuinely horrible, isn't it? Yeah. When they start going, do you know what this this sad ballad about like their grandparents dying needs is some crazy echo, and it's like, please put that down. It's like it's like saying to children, like, oh, please put that down. Having your own crew is the best thing. Like not just front of house, like yeah. having your own, having a, like my my guitar i have a guitar tech called mikey who like actually guitar techs for me in my artist project when i'm playing shows depending on if, if there's budget basically yeah um and he also guitar techs for one of the bands i md for this band called the adelaide's like country pop band um he's there he's the guitar tech for that too well i say guitar tech he's he's the he's just the 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 on the back the backline tech in general because yeah. we don't have we don't have a drum tech we don't have the budget for like multiple techs so yeah we he just kind of covers all bases um he really gets put to work on those shows but he's <laughs> he's wicked i've never had like a guitar tech or you know like individual instrument techs i've only ever had um someone do the sound but i think that i think for like maybe two headline tours i've had someone do sound consistently at every venue but the ones where i haven't there's Terrifying. always I just it is truly <laughs> yeah because yeah, you, you just you don't know what the room's going to sound like so you know it's going to be like a case of figuring out when you get there anyway but then usually the venue if that if it's the venue providing the sound guy it's just some random guy that like would rather be watching <laughs> you know yeah. not necessarily like, like a um into the music you're making just rather be like at home watching the simpsons or whatever sometimes yeah yeah or just in the just in the bar like next door to the venue just yeah like, absolutely yeah it is such a tricky one especially on like lower lower capacity tours where the venues yeah. really vary in terms of not just the room but like the equipment 
if yeah. you're not taught like that's the um biggest thing about like i guess like my job is it like we were talking about my job as an md is like i'm trying to make a consistent show so yeah. like but i ex- the bands that i'm working with in that sense have got like a consistent level of equipment they're going to be bringing to every show in terms of like they'll be touring a front of house desk sometimes and or like at least a front of house engineer that's going to be mixing the show like we'll have the same playback rig the same drums the same mics the same you know everything on the stage so it's easy to get a consistent show every time but when you're on that when you're doing like those kind of smaller capacity tours where like the budget is lower for the for the shows Mm. it means that like stuff has to be compromised and that's where like you feel very at risk and very vulnerable because you you hold obviously like you're you know i'm sure people listen to this podcast if they haven't like haven't heard your music and seen you live like you are a consistently great performer in the sense that like ah, what you, you do no you are you're <laughs> wicked like and but but what let's what can be the scary thing is that you can't control what the sound guy does yeah it you is know? it's uh, it's particularly bad when i don't know if you've experienced this like at a live show or a festival but if you have a, a sound guy who is slightly um, distracted by something and at that moment in time, you need something like you need more more of your vocal in your ears to hear what to hear what your pitch is. And you you're like you're kind of like yeah. making the yeah. eye signals and then it becomes a. When you've got someone who's mixing front of house and monitors at the same time and they're in a field 200 yards away and you're like <laughs> squinting at them in the sun, they're just like, oh, no, he just always looks like that when he's on stage. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm trying to trying to get your attention, you know, for, yeah, hor- horrible you know, yeah. stuff and nightmares. Have you yeah. had any nightmarish stories on tours that you've done for your artist project? Um, trying to th- I mean, I'm sure I have. It's like sometimes Blocking they just them kind out. Of <laughs> trying to blur. Yeah, yeah, block them out. Um, <laughs> hope pray the next night is better or whatever but um yeah i've had like a fair few um kind of car crash moments in gigs where like things have been what i had one in actually in leeds i can't remember what venue it was it might oh, have been no. like a porto, a porto or something like in my hometown. it wasn't Bre- it wasn't brudenell social club i know that it wasn't there because i love that venue so much like yeah it's great have um, you been to it since it got refurbished no, they were doing it last time I was playing there. Yeah, it's it's wicked actually. It's really good. But I can't remember where it was in Leeds, but we had like a nightmare where um, the power tripped out Whoa. in the venue and the desk just like switched off. So for like whilst the and I didn't have during a tech, a song during a song. Um, so and I was like full band as well. So like there was a lot of stuff to switch off. <laughs> Um, but like the light, I was it. The lighting rig went off, and so did the desk. What did you do? I took my in ears out and was like, "What's going on?" Like, I was like, to, "We had, we had a, we had my own front of house on this one actually," um, and they, he was just like, "Just give me five minutes." So I just like did an acoustic like song. It wasn't a big venue; it was like a hundred, hundred and fifty cap. Like, um, I can't remember the name of it now. It's really annoying me. But yeah, I just did like an acoustic song, just like at the front of the stage, got everyone to come around and like be quiet for a sec while I just whilst my my very very nervously sweating sound engineer was like looking at a switchboard like I could see him like in the back like neck there was like a cabinet where all the power was right next to the desk and he was just like scratching his head putting a screwdriver in pulling the screwdriver out scratching his head and then put like perfect timing as soon as the so- I like everyone clapped at the end of the like acoustic song the lights just came back on like it was all part of the show nice. and I was just like I was just joking with him afterwards like yeah if you could do that every night of the tour and we'll make that a part of the show that <laughs> yeah. would be great and he was like I'm not doing that like you know <laughs> Sounds like it it had a good effect though, in a way. Oh yeah, it it worked out. It worked out fine. It was like think on your feet, kind of what would be good in this moment. You know, yeah. they've, they've definitely not all gone that smoothly. <laughs> right at the beginning, when I was first starting out, I definitely pulled my own guitar lead out by standing on it. Classic. And that was not great. <laughs> we've we've all been there. Yeah, rookie yeah. mistake. Um. Yeah, that's probably the worst one I can think of, really, like during a song. I've had a lot of moments before a show started where I've been like, the sound is still not, or something's still feeding back, or some, and it's like five minutes till the doors open. And so that's, they, those kind of situations have been kind of stressful, but always rectified themselves in some way, like magically. Yeah. Um, it, all, it always comes together in the end, in yeah, some way. Does. Like, because no, you have to make it, you just have to. You know? Yeah, true. Do, do you find like, you know, 
um because you don't have a manager right like at the moment no. so so do you find that when you're touring or like playing live shows that you wish there was someone else to kind of take that responsibility you mean if you maybe you have a tour manager that comes or just like a, f- a friend or some like someone in the band or something that like can be a bit of a ball buster in the sense yeah. of like <laughs> yeah. you're gonna make sure this is right by the time <laughs> hannah comes out here <laughs> like you know because sometimes like when you're in charge of the whole operation it can be like whenever i've had like a tour manager or a manager they've never been like a ball busty type really they, they've they've kind of like so like my previous managers have all been very um business orientated rather than right musical direction or um you know kind like, of like like centered around live touring or anything like that yeah i i've had two i've had two managers i'm not i'm not managed by anybody now but i had two managers uh the first manager was very like centered around live um he uh was a booking agent um and like well he's like a, a venue booker um and had managed other people he's not he can you know he un- had an understanding of creating music but wasn't a musician yeah and then my second manager was very like business centered sounds similar to yours but he also was a musician like he did play did play music um but wasn't like t- in a wasn't like technically clued up in terms of like yeah like equipment that I might use in production and stuff, but he did manage two producers, so he learned a lot from oh, cool. from them and having conversations about you know, you know, recording and and had an, a real understanding of that. But in a, if there was a high pressure situation where it's like, oh my god, this is broke in the middle of a show, or <laughs> that like, I wouldn't go to him for that <laughs> yeah. in the, in the, in those in those past. And I think times. the technology has changed so much as well. You know, yeah, massively. In, in live and in production, and so sometimes maybe it's a little bit hard for you know people who've previously been artists or or been musicians who become managers. I feel like sometimes it's hard to to know to still be kind of um, in the know about how things work on a technical side because it's so different than it was when they were artists or. The stuff that happens in a live show now for like a major set, let's say like a major label pop act is doing a tour now. What that is now versus what that was even 10 years ago is so different in terms of the equipment and the kind of the the commonly found gear on a tour. Like yeah. I work with um, a, g- a good mix of artists who are like young, younger or like more modern pop acts as opposed to like some of the one of the artists i work with is um or i've like done a lot of touring with is a guy called tom clark who used to be a front the front man of a band called the enemy like indie oh, band cool. from like 10 years from like 10 they they their first album came out in 2007 which was like a number one so that was like the, the peak 2007 to 2010 was like their peak they had like really really good success then but like they're like an indie band touring with big amps and like very minimal so they didn't start using track until like album four because they had like a bit more kind of oh, okay. vast a bit more of a vast live production whereas like before it was very like a very raw like indie as we imagine it should be like kind of energy and it was like super cool um the stuff that like Tom has taken out on tours that I've been on with him in terms of equipment versus like what I take out on the road as a player in like major label pop acts who are also signed to Warner in 2018, 2019 and and 2020, like is like vastly different in terms of what I need. Like if I was going out, I can't imagine Tom was going out with in-ears and taking a laptop, like, (laughs) you know, and a sound card ready to go to like change bits of track on the road. Yeah. Whereas like, whereas now it's like, you know, so, so different. So it's understandable for managers who have done it previously to now just be managing as opposed to still doing a a project actively, like for them to fall out of touch with the latest stuff, because I think it's hard for even artists to keep up with the latest stuff. Like you get, you get, I don't know about you, but I definitely get set in my ways with like ways I record music and the way I, I, I'm always trying to evolve, like, you know, my understanding of and using new equipment and, you know, new techniques and whatever, but like, there's only so much you can keep up and then use that to your advantage. I mean, if you're constantly learning the new thing, like, you know, I I saw like universal, universal audio just launched like a new, uh, yeah, they yeah. launched their new DLW, which is like, 
I'm like, oh, I'm really going to get on that. And I'm going to get really understand that so I can use it in sessions if it comes up, if I'm like working in a studio and like, oh, we use Luna. I'm like, I want to know my way around it. But like at the same time, I'm like, I just really like working in Logic and Pro Tools at the moment. And I still, yeah. and I use a little bit of Ableton, but like not so much for like recording, like production, more like live stuff. But yeah, trying to, you're trying to make yourself versatile without, like I said at the start, like it's like jack of all trades, master of none. You're trying to like <laughs> understand all these things, but you need to be really good on one of them at least, you know? Yeah. So. Diversification's good though, right? Especially yeah. when you're independent. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think it's crucial actually. Like I think if you can't, yeah. If you can't adapt to uh, the way other people you work with work, then like you're always going to hit roadblocks. It's all about communication at the end of the day. Like if you can't, if you can't communicate ideas across to people because you can't put it onto a certain, you know, you can't use certain equipment to to get those ideas across, then you're never going to get your ideas across at all. Yeah, true. So it can be difficult, but yeah, being being di- being diverse is is the key a lot of the time how do you find being your own manager um sometimes I love it in the sense that like I don't have to kind of run anything by anybody but then sometimes I miss I miss running sometimes it's like you know when you do something wrong and you do something like you know maybe when you're a kid you used to like do something naughty and you know you'd get told off for doing it if you'd have told like your parents that you <laughs> yeah. were going to do it but like you because you didn't tell them you did it anyway like that's what I'm like with my man like ha- not having a manager now I'm like I probably shouldn't be buying this or like I probably shouldn't be doing this thing for the for today like you know but no one's here to tell me different so I'm gonna do it and then actually I'm like no she doesn't it. so it's a fine line but on the whole like I, I do enjoy you know kind of being being the person steering the ship uh yeah solo in the sense but I have I have an amazing team of people that I work with on a regular basis I know you do too with like um is it Ben Song Song Mason like yeah yeah my um, producer and and like to have a good relationship with your distributor I think is so important so like when I stopped working with my manager in last April I I was kind of we we ended on really good terms and we're still really good friends so that was cool but I was kind of worried about how I would move forward or if if there was specific things that I wasn't doing that I wouldn't be able to do just myself um and actually the main change for me is just that it's quicker to communicate with different members of my team because I'm not going through somebody else and you know that you know that the uh, communication is going to be as uh clear as possible because it's coming from your mouth do you know what I mean you're yeah. saying you're saying this is what I feel rather than saying it to a manager and they interpret it yeah in their yeah. own way too I I've definitely found like well actually I've only I've only not had a manager now for like two months oh wow um so it's kind of fresh yeah um and I've not been releasing anything but I'm I, I've always communicated with my whole team myself a lot so yeah. that 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 hasn't been a big change in the dynamic of like the way I work with people. I think it has think, to be like that. Even if you're yeah. not independent, if you can as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. I think I think if you're the person who's speaking to people, then like the, it it tells them that it's important that they're spoken to because if it's worth your time, then it's like as opposed to like oh, I'll just let my manager deal with it or whatever. Like yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for like it coming directly from the artists. Yeah, you know? definitely. But I, I don't feel like I've come across the the hurdle perhaps of speaking to distributors. But I have a pretty good dis- relationship with like the distributors that I've been using over the last couple of years, like in terms of the people that work there. So I'm hoping that the relationship status stays kind of the same. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that they still are happy working with directly with the artists. Because I found that um, in my experience of like when I've, been like the fly on the wall in conversations with some of the major label and like big indie label artists that I, I work with um that the label don't like talking directly to the artist they want to talk to the manager and they like the hierarchy system because it feels like a bit more secure maybe yeah um, I guess there's so more structure and order people, to it <laughs> people like the structure because then it feels more predictable but I think yeah ultimately like rec- you know releasing music and you know it being successful isn't predictable mm. unless you are Adele or like you know I mean I think I think when you're on like a, a lower 
level but again like it's so hard to define what a lower level artist is now because yeah. you know there's people there's people making you know i mean there's people like billy eilish who are making with phineas making number one albums in their bedrooms but there's people there's people who are making like a good living off making music in their in their bedroom like so yeah. you know yeah, but they're still but they might still be defined as a lower level artist because they might not sell any tickets yeah. or to a live show or like they can't you know, there's, there's, everyone's got the different parameters of what they uh, kind of define as a low-level artist. But I think, like, if you've got a good relationship with your distributor, then hopefully you can kind of work towards that together rather than them needing that structure from a manager or whatever to give them reassurance. You know, as long as you can reassure them that you're going to work hard and you're, you're doing everything right... Yeah. They won't need to hear it from a manager as long as you're like, you know, doing it right. You know. Now I was saying to you off camera, like the thing that I find tricky sometimes is um, not having like expert uh, expert advice in a in a particular field anymore. Because I used to, because I used to have that particularly from in like a business sense. But sure. um, but yeah, you know, it's it's definitely doable. There's things that you take on, isn't there? And and most of it's kind of adminy you know yeah. more emails i guess but then is it more or is it just a direct email to the person instead of to the manager it's yeah i think i think that's something i've noticed a lot of in the last two months is that like i'm having more conversations with more people than ever because i'm i'm maintaining relationships with people yeah so whereas normally i might have a, a two-hour phone call with my manager and say we need to get back to this person about this we need to speak to this person about this and this person needs to be told that they're going to have to wait and this person needs to be told that we want to do this and yeah start putting things whereas now i have to speak to all those people directly so like that is adding on more work um but i can be sure it's being done a certain way as well so i've had a couple of situations in the past year where i've had um I've had to have some conversations that that aren't the kind of conversations that artists would have and they haven't been particularly positive and I haven't enjoyed that. <laughs> like, yeah, I can definitely relate. Like to have a manager there as a kind of um, barrier from that side of the industry yeah. and they haven't, they haven't been many occasions but on the odd occasion where there's been like a, something bad has happened and I've either had to sort it out or, or be the guy that's not telling someone off but you know n- not having the nice conversation with someone I it's got to be done at some point it's got to be done but i that's the main thing that i haven't enjoyed about not having a manager i don't know how you feel about that i think uh it's increasingly common that artists are having to have those conversations themselves yeah because i think it, just because you're a manager doesn't mean you don't feel that hesitation as well like i think yeah i think i think like it's difficult to do it, especially and because you want people that a lot of the a lot of managers say like, um, you know, they they be the bad guy, so everyone likes you, and you don't have to do any of the dirty work, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, and they you, people maintain their vision of you being this like really nice, super friendly all the time artist. Mm. But like, as 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 like the industry is becoming more and more transparent every day with the way we kind of display ourselves on social media constantly, like. People becoming, you know, people aren't just artists anymore. They're like influencers at the same time. Do you know I mean, because they have to like have this constant um, feel sometimes feels like a lot of artists feel like they have to have this constant um, uh, presence. Word? Like, presence online. Yeah. Where where people see everything that's going on. And actually, like that makes it really difficult for you to separate um, yourself from all those different roles. So I saw that you were starting up a Patreon page. I am, yeah. I'm going to launch it on Friday. That's the plan. Tell us about that. I do a weekly Instagram live on Sunday nights and I pretty much always play a new song or like an unreleased song that maybe I've played live at shows that never got released on Spotify and I always want to put stuff out um, that people can hear along the way of like making new music and making like my first album, for example, I've only ever put out EPs before. So, um, I don't like it when so many songs fall to the wayside 
and no one ever hears them again other than other than on a live stream or a show so i wanted to do like a a monthly download kind of thing i've d put a bunch of other stuff in it too obviously to make it not just like one thing but um the premise is that i want to put out more content and give people more music without having it on spotify um where like it really matters how much it like takes off like i want to make an album that's like majority new and i'll do singles leading up to it there'll be like three or four songs that come out as singles perhaps or maybe three and then i release singles from that album once that album's out but i want people like to be able to find a whole album and hear you know a whole body of work that's kind of new that yeah. is like what they were hopefully what they were hoping for too um, I think that's because cool. it, but it's i guess that's a very dated way of releasing music well it like we were saying before, you should only do what you want to do as well. You know, if yeah. that's the way you want to release it, then what's the point of doing anything else if you don't want to do that? I think Patreon's great because you can get like constructive feedback on song demos. Yeah. Um, but also it's an extra income stream, which with having to diversify as independent artists is just great, really. I totally agree. I think that building a community of people who genuinely want to support your music and put their money where their mouth is and say like, even if it's a pound a month, like that transaction of saying this is worth more than getting it for free, like means so much to artists. It's not necessarily about, you know, them giving you more money than anybody else. It's like they want to be part of something, a part of a community, part of um, supporting your music. And I think like, it's a win-win situation for everybody. If they want more music, then paying a monthly subscription allows you to do that, allows you to create that. Then they're going to get what they want and you're going to get what you want because you're enabled by your community of supporters to do more music, which yeah. is what we all want to do, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I've seen a lot of people and myself, like I have a Patreon page and I, I love it because it feels like a more personal social media. Definitely. I'm look I'm really looking forward to doing it. I'm actually gonna be like doing a blog on mine. Oh cool. As well. Because I have a lot of things that I have to say about a lot of different and I've got a lot of like stories and stuff, I guess, as well. Like and I wanna tell people about all the different people that I work with in my little J D family. I have like a little Joe Dolman group chat on WhatsApp, which is like my whole to everyone who works in my project. I'm very like I, I involve people in everything, you know. Yeah. Not not to like swarm them with stuff, but just include people as much as possible and um i'm really looking forward to like sharing a bit more about those people in the blog and like saying what their background is and why they're so amazing basically and like it's going to be fun to kind of invite people into my little world a bit so off camera we briefly spoke about a project that you are launching next year a new project so i guess kind of following on from what we we're just talking about about um lots of music that isn't necessarily representative of your artist project right now in um, in like defining what you want to make right now. I often find myself writing with lots of different artists and producers and writers. And I, a, fr a good friend of mine, we write together for, for my own music and we write for other artists as well. And we just ended up writing loads of songs together and realizing that we had like a great partnership of something that wasn't wasn't for me or for anybody else it was just like a project that we were kind of naturally kind of formed and I'm launching this project next year and we were talking off camera about like branding about how everything is so transparent now and you, like you said it's about having that constant presence yeah online and it's good that you've got like a place to get your you know like some of the songs that aren't necessarily for the Joe Dolman project out because uh, I think like that's something that I've found slightly hard um writing a song that i think is well i used to do this actually writing a song that i think is great but isn't hannah trigwell and so the first song that i put out that i was like that's not hannah trigwell but i'm hell like i wrote it so i'm just gonna put it out like i'm just gonna put it under my solo name not start a new thing and just just go with it was um a song called Attention, which came out last year. Yeah, but that's such a banger. And I, <laughs> like, literally such a banger. I remember people being like, what 
you know, some people genuinely were like, what are you doing? Like, what's, really? what's this? Like, are you... I did not expect that at all. I thought that was like, <laughs> I didn't think that was like untrue to you at all. I thought it was like, I feel like really... it's, it's my voice. Like, do, I... do you feel like it's not true to what, what you yeah, are I think as an I, artist? I think it is true. I think that I've, I was, you know, I naturally just slipped into singer, songwriter and folky because as you say, like one voice and a guitar, there's only so many kind of sounds that you can make like that. Um, but I've always written in a very, very pop structure and always loved pop and always listened to pop over anything else. And so like yeah. when we were working on this song and then there wasn't a specific person who it was for, um, you know, subconsciously or like, just without me, like in my head, just wrote this song, loved the song, and then was like, but if, you know, if I've written it, then, sh like, why shouldn't I put it out? Absolutely. I think if you, if you have a clear vision of how something should be, yeah. then maybe you should see it through. And for me, and like, see. the evolution from folky acoustic to pop, I was just ready to do it, you know. Um, I think that's what I mean by seeing seeing when that song came out, I was like buzzing because a it's like a massive tune and also like <laughs> it just seemed it just seemed like it's the right thing a, to do. I it think. seemed like such a natural transition for you because yeah. like you know we we haven't like known each other like crazy long, but based on like your the music you make and the music that you like share in like Spotify playlists or like stuff that you put on your Instagram story like love this song or whatever like that that attention song is true to your own interests and your yeah, own absolutely. genuine like the the kind of music you like so it's only natural that the music you make not copies what you like obviously but like yeah reflects reflects in your influences do you know what I mean it yeah. happens with me i think it happens with me too like i've put out songs where like i put out a song called the middle at the start of this year that's very not not similar in um style to attention at all but like the it was like a real transition away from acoustic guitar into yeah. something something different that people were like, oh my God, that sounds so different, you know, but yeah. really it's never, I've never sounded more like me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny that way, the way it works out like that sometimes. I mean, I guess major label artists must feel actually more confined to a genre than independent artists in a way, because in whatever the project is when it's been signed or then that's kind of what they're expected to produce, right? Definitely, I'm, in my experience of um, of that with with other artists, they've there's been a real um, concentration on a specific uh, aesthetic, a specific just a, a specific package overall in terms of the music, the branding, the ev everything that yeah. says this is this is what we signed you to be because we think you're going to be brilliant if you do that. But the artist might be like, yeah, but I did that a year ago and then you eventually signed me and now I'm making this, which is way over here and it's totally different now. And it's like, the artist might not love that as much as they love this new thing over here. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Because everything's so tra transparent and it's like, oh, well, they're signed. So their first album is going to be huge because they're going to have all this backing and stuff. Like you have to have a career defining album by your first single now. It's not even the album. People don't wait for the <laughs> album. It's like, you know, your first single has to be absolutely, you know, catastrophically big <laughs> yeah or or you've or you flopped and it's like yeah. so much pressure but like imagine imagine like michael jackson never got to album three think how many songs we wouldn't have got to if he got dropped after his first album because it wasn't the career defining album it needed to be imagine like john mayer didn't get to continuum he just stayed at room for squares and they were like yeah it wasn't quite there like it didn't hit the numbers we were hoping for or whatever like i think it's so important to let artists grow into yeah. what they're going to be and it's it must be because... hard from a business point of view for labels to do that as well, in a way. It's a lot of, uh, yeah, they have it's... to put so much trust yeah. in, in the artist to keep and going. And like time and money and, yeah. and so, you know, if they do, I'm sure there's a lot of artists that have been dropped that if they'd have just had that one more album or track or whatever would have made the thing. Yeah. You know, that one song that, that really takes them to higher places but I don't know whether it's as possible anymore because there's so many artists now that are getting signed the turnover is so much faster isn't it even but it's the it's not just the art it's not just the turnover of the artists it's the turnover of the people working in the labels you know like yeah lab, label execs and you know 
presidents, vice presidents of, of the labels themselves are on twelve are on twelve month contracts because God. they're they're having to like top the last person who was doing that job and yeah. bringing more revenue because they're trying to keep their business model relevant because yeah. what a record label's job is massively you know we talk about how much we have to diversify as an artist imagine not being needed to make albums anymore like because you can just do it in your bedroom like they're like now having to massively diversify why they're important and what they can offer in services in return for the massive cut they take or like buying the licenses or, you know the copyright for the for the master tracks you know like yeah. if all the music's been recorded and produced and mixed and mastered in someone's own time then what do we need the label for it's that constant argument but this is the kind of thing that the labels are having to turn around just as fast as 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 the artists so it's it's a constantly evolving thing and i like you see a lot of artists and bands i don't know if you come across this but i certainly see a lot of artists like hating on their labels and hating on like yeah absolutely. Or, like saying oh <laughs> all labels suck and blah blah it's like well they're just doing a job too you know they're mm -hmm they've got their own agenda as well and everybody has and i think like being independent you can decide how much of that you take in and how much you keep out of your project you know yeah so, and there has to be there, there always there always has to be compromise if you like went into a label office and was like imagine a record label wanted to sign you and you were like and just before you went in you were like hannah don't go in there and compromise a single thing like you can't <laughs> do that you have to be able to compromise on stuff yeah. But you have to choose what you compromise on. You know, you like yeah. you won't compromise. Say you you might say you won't compromise on certain things, but you will on others. You know, you know maybe there's a conversation to ha like if you want to be a pop act and you want to be played on the radio, you're gonna have to compromise on every song on your album being shorter than six minutes. You know, you know, you know if you're if you're but if that's what you want to do, then you're gonna have to accept that they're not gonna want to sign you because if they're looking to get their artists played on the radio to get that exposure or whatever it is like yeah there's certain there's certain like parameters that need to be met by both sides i think people do often think that independent artists if they if they've been vocal about being independent hate major labels <laughs> and yeah it, there's a big like association right yeah um and like i don't know for me it's not the case but i i've seen a lot of people who are who have become independent through not through a choice of their own and mm -hmm. because of a miscommunication or you know whatever and whatever's happened with the label they are now independent and therefore now hate major labels and it's you know you don't know what goes on in every single relationship between an artist and a major label but it is a business and i think it's such a, a tricky thing because you as an artist you pour your emotions into these songs and you have such a an emotional connection to your project but it's a business at the end of the day and usually like you know personal emotional stuff and business doesn't mix very well my question for you then is do you think every artist um who is out there today cares about the songs and the artistic vision as deeply as as like you and I do and you know th like we just talked about those artists who like um have a hard time with the labels because the uh, the label might be trying to change their project or like streamline it or confine it to a certain yeah. thing but do you think there's artists do you think that's sort of the case for all artists or do you think there's some artists that are like I just want to be famous and I want to be a great pop star and I want to sing songs so, oh yeah I mean? so, absolutely I think I think there are some cases where it's you can see it sometimes and, it, and it's really obvious and you know I've done I'm not going to drop any names because I don't want to be that guy but um but I think for those people it's much easier to compromise in terms of art because there's not as much emotional connection to it especially if they're not writing it the less they're writing the music themselves um the less they might be invested in what it means because if it's not coming from them, then it might not be yeah. about something they really connect with, tr truly. Uh, yeah, like, uh, especially if they don't write. I don't think there's anything wrong with not writing music that you release. Sure. I just think it must be, it must be easier to make compromises on, like, artistic direction and stuff if you 
either don't write it because you don't want to write it, but if you just if you're not a writer, you know, because we talk about like artist versus songwriter a lot in in the music industry, um, in terms mm. of like you know different roles involved with each of those titles, but you know, an artist could be someone who writes every last word of that song and has got their heart and soul on the line for their story and their lives versus another artist who is seen in the in the limelight by by the by the world in the exact same you know position as that other artist that cares about every last detail and then next stood right next to them is someone who doesn't care about any of that stuff they just want to be the singer and like <laughs> and they're yeah. they're both valid and if if you know if the person is not actually in any way like what they're portraying on stage in real life that person is a performance artist yeah. there's just so many layers yeah to it, there really there? is and it's like a it's a constantly evolving thing as the expectations of what what it means to be an independent artist especially in i think mm. i think the expectation of independent artists is getting bigger by the day um you know oh, like yeah, definitely. you know how many times have you had a conversation about tiktok in the last two years and like <laughs> and and how many yeah it's it's getting increasingly yeah, intense it's like i'm i i've said like to you before like i'm not you know visual stuff is not my like forte i don't really feel like i don't enjoy expressing myself in visual content where i'm mm. in it like where i'm viewed in it i don't really care for that side of the artistic display like maybe because i just yeah. don't have any experience in it or like i just it might be like a self-confidence thing. I don't know, but um, I just love um, making music and creating like, I love making album artwork and stuff like that, you know, but yeah. in terms of just on the whole, like visual stuff, like video content isn't my like set, like I don't feel most comfortable there. So I find it hard. To... You're going to give TikTok a miss. Well, this is the thing I constantly, like I have an account on TikTok. I have 12, I have 12 okay. followers. I've never posted a video. Um, so you know any day now I could be a viral sensation um, you never know you never um, know so I I would love to I'd love to do it but I feel so much that's what I mean about the expectations of an artist like there's so much pressure for me to be viral on TikTok not just do it like mm -hmm. everything you do has to be a massive success if you put out a single on Spotify it has to be you know a million streams in x amount of days hours seconds like it's just ridiculous how the expectation is so high because yeah. and it's because we can do so much for ourselves which is a beautiful thing that it's like you kind of live and die by the same sword in the sense in the sense they're like you know oh yeah i i write record you know produce my own music with with other people of course as well as doing it by myself like i make my own music videos and like my own artwork and i put you know i even run my own promotions company and put on my own tours and i like do i do so much independently that it's amazing i have so much control creatively to do what i want but people know the world knows that well, artists can do that now so they expect you yeah. to deliver you know even though i've never showed people that i want to be a tiktok guy or like do tiktok um you know people expect me to be really successful at it even though i've never tried it or have never even showed an interest in it so that's why i steer off it because i'm like i don't want people to now think less of what I do put my time into i.e. making music etc like I don't want them to them to see like the fail like I'm, I'm already predicting a failure of my TikTok success before I've even done it <laughs> but like imagine I put out stuff on TikTok like making videos you know music stuff whatever and it didn't take off the people who did mm. see it and then watched it not take off are gonna then be like they're going to have less faith in my whole project because they've seen something not take off. Like you kind of like have to pick, I feel like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like this pick and choosing of like where you put your time and trying to ho hope that everything you do does well. So people believe in it. Like, you know, there's nothing worse than people mm -hmm. seeing like you've been promoting your brand new song for a month, you know, take it back to the music. You're an independent artist. You've been promoting your brand new single for a month straight. You put the song out and no one likes it. People have less faith in your, music now and that's fair enough because they don't like your music or like your music isn't is but it is kind of like you have one chance. but now the pressure is on so many different levels like you have to you know launch a, a tiktok or a youtube channel or you know whatever it is you do like 
it has to be a raging success. Every tour has to sell out. Every, you know, there's mm-hmm. there's such a demand for. Well, it's not even demand. It's like such an expectation of things to be perfect because there are people who do it independently who nail it. Yeah, but it, it, in the same way that like a, a a massive superstar is like one in. Well, it used to be one in a million, one in a billion mm. now. Let's say um, <laughs> it's it's still that kind of way on the internet you know um for someone to get like viral video after viral video after viral video it's it's the same kind of ratio but people like you say like most people don't think about it like that they're like you know have you consistently put out viral videos on tiktok and if you haven't oh well you you must not be that exactly and it's like (laughs) that's the kind of pressure that i just like I, cr- I crumble under it big time and it's like I'm not ashamed to say that do you know I mean like it's I'm I'm okay yeah. like I sleep perfectly well at night knowing that I have my strengths and weaknesses as an as an artist as an independent musician business you know whatever you want to call it you know I think having that like personal insight is so important when you're independent you've got to be honest because with yourself if you do absolutely yeah and if you do try and like force yourself to be Maybe not even to be good at something, but to like something or to enjoy a certain part of something. It it's just not sustainable, yeah. and you just end up making something or doing something that's not good or like not um, worth the time that you've put into. Well, it, it won't be worth it because it won't be genuine. So it's never going to connect if it's not genuine. Yeah. Like if you don't, you know, you can genuinely love making stupid TikToks, and that's cool. Like, well, I say <laughs> stupid. I mean like just silly, funny videos, like that aren't maybe as serious as like your music might be, you know, Lewis Capaldi, like wearing a thousand pairs of sunglasses every day. Like, you know, he, he <laughs> genuinely has fun doing that by the looks of it. That is quality. It content, is quality content. You that know, is quality content. You know, like, so you look at something like that, it's like, okay, he's, it's genuinely, it's genuine to him because he loves doing it. You know, it's fun. But mm. if you don't have fun yeah. doing that, then don't do it. Like, I think, I think, yeah. and, and being transparent with people, like people ask me like, People mess me like, when are you going to start doing TikTok? I want a duet with you or whatever. It's like, well, I just say to people like, I don't think I am because it's not really my, it's not really my vibe. Like, mm. and I think it's th- weird though the amount of people that do do that out of, like you say, like out of um, a pressure to do. Like, I, I know a lot of YouTubers who make videos consistently, and they don't really want to do that, and that is just so bizarre. Yeah, I think it's crazy because I'm someone who consistently feels the pressure to make videos but but doesn't (laughs) and I just have to live with the consequences that I don't have the numbers online that like people who do consider like I think if you put the time into it then yeah you're work you you deserve the numbers and I fully you know know, but I don't put the time in so I don't I'm not worthy of the numbers if you did put the time in then would it even mean anything if you didn't like doing it I suppose it depends how much you value the numbers really because if it is like just for fun and you got like five listens on something or you know I've put songs out sometimes where I wasn't sure if anyone would listen to it and a lower number of people listen to it than my average number of people mm-hmm. or whatever and it's just felt good that it was out yeah. and like I just love I loved everything about like I loved the song I loved the artwork I loved the video so it didn't really matter and I think that is that to me makes just more sense than doing things for the sake of it. But I agree. I think I, I think defining defining your expectations going into a, any release of any content, be a YouTube video, a TikTok, or a song or an album, like defining your expectations of what you want to get out of it before you before you yeah. even make it, first and foremost, but also before you put it out, like defining your expectations on numbers and stuff like that. Like I'm I'm not someone who cares about numbers in the sense that like i i don't make music for the numbers but i when it comes to like that that's the thing making music is a separate thing for me because i just do it because i want to do it and it you know you know i'll spend as much time on it as i need to spend on it for it to be right whereas like video you know stuff like tiktok that kind of video content that i don't make i feel like i would only be making it for the numbers to kind of match up to this expectation that I feel exists on independent artists. Um, And because I'd be like focusing so hard on that, it would probably not work because it wouldn't be genuine. It's just, it's just like as an independent, like I said, it's people expect you to, 
do everything because you can in the sense that mm. nobody's stopping you no label no nothing no nothing's getting in the way because you can you can buy you know you can make music on really basic like software you can film video content on your phone you know you know it's like the 80 music video ed sheeran made was like 20 pound budget do you know what I mean it's like you know you yeah. know you listen to like in interviews of like Phineas talking about Billie Eilish's album. It's like, oh yeah, I use loads of stock Logic plugins. Like, you know, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, so there's no, that when when that stuff gets in the public domain, it shows people there is no limit to what you can do if you put the time in, but there is a limit you can put on yourself, which is like, do I want to do that? Well, no, so I don't do it, mm. you know. And it's hard because then you worry about what the consequences of that um, decision will be, you know. Previously with your managers that you had, did they kind of try to push you ever into doing stuff like on socials that you didn't want to do? Yes. Definitely. I think... Which, and fair enough, rightly so. Yeah, I, I it's hard, isn't More it? Because like yeah. a manager only makes money if you make yeah. money. As much as you can be like best friends with your manager, there's always going to be things that maybe you disagree on if you don't want to do. But if you don't do them, then potentially you won't make as much money as they want you to make to take that 20% or whatever the sure. cut might be. I think we all have to deal with um, that kind of pressure from managers as well. And and there's been times, you know, previously with my former managers when I've felt bad actually for not doing more. Even though I've done loads of, you know, maybe I've made like a music video for a song and I've made a lyric video and doing this and that. I'm like, if it's not done well, that's the thing with a manager where I've been like, oh, I actually feel bad. Mm -hmm. Because they're dependent on this as well. Yeah, I have a very similar feeling from when I like, you know, because actually my previous manager manager didn't didn't take a cut from me as a musical director or a session player or anything like that. He was just he just yeah. he was just an artist manager. He only managed me as an artist. So if I went on tour for three months with somebody and then went straight into a festival season playing, you know, pretty much every weekend, um, for two months across the summer, like and then and mm. then put out something as an artist like he was only getting a cut on that one month out of six months time you know so you yeah, fe I feel bad tough, like and I've always like been like maybe you should be taking more but then but I but the reason I had them was to push me as an artist and then there's like a compromise to be made yeah you know? it's it's so yeah but absolutely. it's good that you know it shows that you actually care about the people you work with when you actually feel bad you know that yeah that, like you're <laughs> yeah. You understand that they are, you know, investing in you with their time and effort. And you mm. feel they deserve something for that, which obviously they do. But you also have to be honest with yourself about what you want to do with your life and your time, you know, and your career. Yeah. So it can be a, a, a very tricky balancing act, which is all under the public eye, you know. Pre-internet, a lot of things didn't used to be if if you were playing in a certain city then that city would know yeah but maybe the other cities wouldn't and if that city didn't sell hardly any tickets then only that city yeah. would know <laughs> but now everywhere you know if you have if you have a gig that doesn't sell particularly well or whatever it is in a particular area then that's like that's common knowledge now yeah, isn't it yeah exactly everything everything's common knowledge now almost it feels unfortunately we are out of time but I want to say thanks so much for speaking to me today and ask you a question. What is your track of the week? Oh, good question. Let me pull up Spotify. Ah, that you need to know it off by heart. No, it doesn't count. I'm, I'm going to cheat. <laughs> I'm categorically cheating. Uh, my track of the week this week um, is... I'm Lonely by Luz. That's probably my track of the week this week. It was between that. Oh, I do It was like between that. that and a song called Older Than I Am by Lennon Stella on a new album that came out on Friday. And I really love that album. So Lennon Stella is a singer from Nashville, yeah. which is incredible. Definitely recommend people to watch that on Netflix. Is it on? I think it's on Netflix. It was on ABC, yeah. I think, in, in, in the States, but I think it's on Netflix okay. now. And then my final question, what is the best lesson that you've learned so far in your career without it sounding really cynical no one will care about your music as much as you do and I don't mean that in like a and it's really sad that that's the case it's more just like <laughs> be be
be aware that everyone has their own agenda. And uh, what I think the positive side of that is that because everyone uh, has their own agenda, you should be grateful for when people care about your thing because they've got their own thing they're caring about as well. You know, their own their own like vision of their own direction of their career. So if someone puts their time in to help you with yours, like you should be super grateful for that and never take it for granted. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Jim. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. See you soon when the world starts spinning again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning into this episode. Be sure to hit subscribe and leave a comment to let us know what you think. And I will see you next time on Backstage Pass. Backstage Pass.